say something nice to the Lord before we begin. Just hallowed his name. Praise him for all he's done this today. Just praise him. Glorify his name. Welcome him into our midst. Bye. 
invite your presence tonight. We ask, oh God, that you will fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. We are gathered down at your feet, oh God. We ask that you have your way tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. We ask, oh God, that you cleanse us from the crowns of our head to the soles of our feet. Father, we pray that you have your own way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we please rise to our feet? Out of the Monday to where I'm all day, where we're made, where made, we're made from things and see. There are realms of glory for my world to see. Dimensions found only in Jesus Christ the Son. Channels of my spirit open up. I am with the Father open up. No boundaries, no limit, open up. Let the deep call on to deep, open up. Channels of my spirit tonight, open up. I am with the Father. like Jehovah we worship Jehovah tonight we adore him tonight because there is no God like him hallelujah there's no God like Jehovah 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 there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Oh, He comes riding on the cloud, shining like the sun. Shine like the 
tonight I just want you to worship the one who holds your life your future our lives let me say our future in our hands just lift up your voice and adore the king of kings let the king be lifted up tonight I just want you to lift up the name of our God there is no name like the name Jesus there is no king like our king there is no God like our God Father tonight we stand to worship there is no king like you oh God there is no God like you we worship you Lord there is no God like you there is no king like you oh God just lift up your voice and hallow the name of the king. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Word is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise.
Everything that is not of you. A fire goes before you and burns up all your enemies. The hills melt like wax in the presence of the Lord. Father, let your presence be strong here tonight. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. receive from the Lord tonight I want to ask that fire to purify us refine us fire purge me oh God the fire goes before you before your word comes let your fire purge me oh God purify my heart so we sing that together as a prayer to the Lord
on our feet again. Give us your vision. Give us your purpose. Touch each one gathered here tonight. Let your kingdom come. <laughs> Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. We forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Before you take your seats, could you high five five people and just say, God will touch you tonight. will touch you tonight. Oh, oh, I don't want to go the same way I came. Touch me with your privilege to have with us a couple that flew how many thousand miles? You don't know. <laughs> Lots of miles all the way from the US of A um, to come share and minister by the Spirit of God. They come from the Global Awakening uh, Movement uh, with Randy Clark. We heard from Hannah Camden, Camden this morning. And her husband, Brian, and herself are going to share uh, with us tonight. But I'd like to encourage you to open yourself up. Just say to the Lord, I am here. Whatever you have for me, I am willing to receive. Touch me. 
and use me. Um, it's not just for you to be blessed, but we are trusting God that you will become a blessing. We will become channels of God's blessing in the name of Jesus. So could we give a big Harwich welcome, British welcome to Camden and Ryan. Thank you very much, Pastor. Is this your Bible? It is. Okay. Let me give this to you. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for the beautiful worship leading us into the presence of God. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Good? You look good. You look better than me. I'm still overcoming uh, jet lag. But I'm feeling much better than, this, than uh, this morning. And it really is an honor to be here with you. Um, I won't teach too long tonight, only about three hours. <laughs> and we'll have ministry. <clears throat> hmm. All right, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, I ask that your ministry would be at the forefront tonight, not my own. That your ministry, Holy Spirit, would be at the forefront tonight. We thank you for the fact that you reveal the person of Jesus to us. We thank you for the incredible revelation, the promises that came from you, Lord. Immediately before your crucifixion, the last moments that you spent with the 12, with your apostolic leaders, Lord, with your disciples. Father, in John 14 through 17, you gave us so many incredible promises and truths concerning the coming of the Spirit, Lord, that you made possible through not only the incarnation, but your death, your burial, resurrection, your ascension into heaven. And when the Spirit was sent, Lord, you told us, you told us through the telling to your disciples that there are so many things that you had to tell them at the moment, but they couldn't bear it. And God, you said that when the Spirit would come upon the earth, God, what we saw through the encounter that took place on the Feast of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 with the 120 in the upper room, when you came and you filled that space and tongues like fire rested upon them. You said that when this happened, when the Spirit of truth came, that the Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that we are living in the reality that so many, Lord, long to see. God, we get the honor of living within the reality of a covenant that Moses longed to see, that all God's people could be as prophets, that all could be the recipient of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. God, that we get to live in a reality that Abraham longed to see, that Joshua longed to see, to see that Hezekiah, that Habakkuk, that Micah, that Joel, that Isaiah longed to see, that Jeremiah longed to see, Lord, that we get to live in the reality of the new covenant as recipients of the new covenant spirit. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the privilege of hearing from you for the reality of what it is to be grafted into the new covenant, that you have shifted us, you have transitioned us through the transaction of your blood being shed at the cross and the scourging at the hands of the Romans. Lord, you've shifted us out of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of your glorious Son. And we thank you for that. We thank you for that, Lord, for your goodness, 
your glory, your righteousness, your justice, your mercy, that you reign triumphant over the earth, that you have crushed Satan under your feet and therefore our feet. Lord, that we stand in your victory and live victoriously because of what you've done. Father, thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. All right. Now, sometimes you have when you travel. Well, I'll, 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 let me rephrase that. You, you always have some sort of problem. Now, you have sometimes bad problems and sometimes good problems. And what I have been experiencing today is a good problem rather than a bad problem. Here's what I mean by a good problem. I only have tonight with you and tomorrow morning. The challenge is, therefore, why it's a good problem is I have kind of had the task of deciding, number one, what should I do, because I only have two sessions with you. Secondly, how do I condense all of this subject material into a small amount of time? Like I said, only three and a half hours with you tonight. Because we ordinarily travel and teach on these things for literally often I will, uh, no, I'm kidding tonight, but I, it's very, very routine that I'll spend three and a half hours on a lot of the subjects, uh, if not more, that I want to bring to you tonight and tomorrow morning, specifically in the area of healing. Uh, as I've gone back and forth, I think I have landed on what I want to give you tonight before we step into ministry at the end, and we want to make sure to have plenty of time for ministry. <clears throat> Now, I need to ask something. Uh, how many of you are going to be able to be here tomorrow morning? Okay, good. It looks like everybody. All right, so here's our game plan. Tonight, I'm going to focus primarily on healing and what I do want to do tomorrow morning, not that we won't pray for healing tomorrow morning, because we absolutely will. In fact, I want to encourage you, uh, as you're able to come tomorrow, whoever you're able to find, either in your kind of immediate vicinity or even if some people have to travel a little bit out of the way, maybe ride with you, uh, or you can just personally invite them to come. Uh, people who need physical healing, we really want to encourage you, Camden and I, bring them, uh, invite them to come, uh, even if they're not Christians, even if they're entirely atheistic, skeptical, uh, Hindu, Muslim, what have you. Invite them to come. When it comes to healing of not only the soul, but the spirit and the healing of bodies, we, we can often overlook this, but God doesn't care whether or not they're already in the kingdom when it comes to his will to heal them, to make them whole. Does that make sense? Now, of course, he cares if they're in the kingdom. It's his will that everyone would be saved. He wants them to know Jesus, absolutely. But he'll come and touch them regardless of how pagan they are. He really will. As a matter of fact, you will be astonished at how often... God will come and begin to pour out the Spirit in all manner of different expressions and manifestations on people that don't yet know him. And that taste of his goodness will draw them under repentance. You saw this, uh, you've seen this frequently throughout the history of the church. One of my favorite examples is with the man who we now know as St. Patrick, uh, who was not Irish, he was kidnapped by Irish pirates when he was about 16 years of age, taken to Ireland, given the name of Patrick. But Patrick had an incredible technique of evangelism, and he actually pulled this from the early apostolic age of the church. What he would do is bring people who were druids, who were steeped in occultism and Satanism and all different manners of paganism, and he would bring them, despite them not yet believing in the gospel, and say, come join us. So what Patrick would do, what the early church would do, is show and tell. The gospel, whether we realize it or not, is meant to be show and tell. It's meant to be word and deed married together. And uh, somewhere along the way, we don't have time to dig into all of the history of tonight or tomorrow uh, in the short time we have together, but for many different reasons and factors along the way, much of the church lost sight of that element of display element of the gospel connected to action, connected to deliverance, connected to the miraculous, connected to signs and wonders. 
I want to encourage you, uh, after we leave, at your study particularly of the New Testament and the incarnation and the proclamation that the kingdom of God is here in your midst, which was not only true when Jesus declared it then, it's true right now. The kingdom is present. It's present. In fact, Jesus never once, in referring to the kingdom of God, speaks of something far off. He gives two dimensions. He says the kingdom is at hand and the kingdom's within. In Luke eleven twenty, one of my favorite verses about the reality of the kingdom of God, he's in the middle, Jesus says, of having just delivered a man, he's driven demons out of this man, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious leaders, have come before him. And Luke says that they ask him, or actually they accuse him initially of driving out the demons from this man by the power of the prince of demons, by the power of Beelzebub, by the power of the devil. And, uh, you know, Jesus has an amazing sense of humor. He's very funny, as a matter of fact, if you kind of carefully read through the scriptures. And so they give this accusation, you're driving out demons by the prince of demons. And Jesus says to them, okay, well, explain this to me. If I'm driving them out by the power of the devil, by whom do your sons cast them out? To me, that's very funny. And Jesus says that. He flips the tables on them, uh, sometimes literally and much of the time metaphorically in the scriptures. <clears throat> and he flips the tables on them here. And after this accusation, Jesus makes a connection that's a very relevant connection that Paul, among Luke and others throughout the New Testament, would take in perpetuity and continuity and continue along with this theme of the gospel being connected to power. In the 20th verse of Luke 11, Jesus responds to them in the midst of this context of accusation, and he says this. He says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, which throughout the Old Testament in their Israeli understanding, Hebraic understanding, Jewish understanding, theologically, the finger of God always was referring to the person and act of power ministry of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come near. And in the Greek, the language is actually that the kingdom, it, it's violent language. That what is happening, and we could substitute that, driving out of demons for a healing of any manner of sickness and disease, as well as a moment of salvation, which is the greatest miracle. That in the moment that supernatural manifestation occurs by the power of of the Spirit of God, as that exchange takes place, his realm pierces our own. And when that happens, dominion, territory, is taken back from the enemy and reclaimed for the kingdom. How many of you know that's what we're meant to do? The pastor has said it, that we're not only coming into the kingdom and recipients of the gifts of the Spirit to be blessed ourselves, but that in that act of receiving blessing, receiving grace, receiving transformation, sanctification, rejuvenation by the Spirit, that is meant to produce fruit within us. So we're not just recipients, but that which we have received, we then give away. We are beneficiaries to then become benefactors. I can say it like that. <clears throat> is this making sense? Okay. All right. Now, what I'm going to do is run through the theological portion of this quickly so I can have time to tell you some stories. I'm going to speak to you specifically tonight about words of knowledge and uh, have plenty of time to not only model that, uh, but then move into the other elements of the way that we're going to do healing ministry tonight. Uh, there are many, many different things pertaining to healing, that if I had more time, I would be delivering to you and, and, and giving you. But this is one of the most effective to deposit within a congregation, within a community, and to bring, I'll use this word, activation to communities within the church regarding seeing healing happen right here and right now. And to take this not only from within the congregational setting, within the walls of the church, but outside of here which is primarily where we are to do evangelization, primarily where most of us are to do ministry. Most individuals within the church are not called into any type of five-fold ministry. 
most people are not called to be pastors and prophets and evangelists and apostles and teachers. But the differentiation in call does not diminish the call. It's just different. The fivefold is meant specifically to denote leadership positions within a local body and through the church, nationally, internationally, the various metrons of influence. That does not mean that someone is greater than someone who is what people would refer to as an ordinary Christian, which, by the way, I want to tell you there is no such thing as that. There's such thing as clouded vision. There's such thing as deception that the enemy perpetuates to cause people to think you're ordinary. But you have the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwelling in you. Dwelling in you. Think about that. The gravity of that. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead quickens your mortal bodies. 1 John 3, 8, you have received an anointing from the Holy One dwelling within you. The same Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. That means, whether you realize it or not, none of you is of what some would call mediocre Christianity. None of you are called to something nominal in the kingdom. There are no second-class citizens in the kingdom. In fact, what the Lord does is take any thought of classism in the kingdom, and he rebukes that thought. He rebukes that line of thinking. Now, the enemy comes once again, and he tries to bring it back up and cause us to believe that. In fact, one of the greatest threats historically to the body of Christ has been a thought of classism or elitism, that some are greater than others. And it's really not the case. There's just differences in calling. But regardless of the differences in calling, there are some things that every single believer is called to do. All of you are called to do. And that includes the proclamation of the gospel with word and deed, with power attached to it. That's your call, to be an army. God has no bench warmers in the kingdom. No bench warmers. No one is saved. You're brought into the kingdom. And let's say we have these few people here. What do you, what's your name? Judah. Judah. Awesome name. Praise. What's your name? What is it? Shalom. And your name? Ephwa. So let's take these three here, these beautiful and handsome people, and let's say I'm the Holy Spirit. I come. I quicken their hearts. All three of them. They've now been grafted into the kingdom. What the enemy wants you to believe is that I would say, okay, Judah, you're going on the front lines of the battlefield. Here's a sword. Here's a shield. Here's a bow and arrow. Here's how to use it. Here's the training and the equipping. Here's the empowerment, the grace, the divine enablement to go and destroy the works of the devil, to shine a salt and light, to be as I was in the world. Now you are incarnating me to those who are around you because my spirit dwells in you. And you guys... Yeah, you just you t go sit, you know, over here on the side and you watch Judah. But isn't it ironic that that's exactly what so many in the kingdom think? God has already given them, in many cases, more than enough, more than everything they need to accomplish kingdom task, and they just don't know it. So we're going to obviously be equipping. We're going to have a lot of ministry tonight, ministry tomorrow, especially tomorrow on impartation, laying on of hands, and a lot of you are going to be even further taken into experiential things of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of the empowerment of some of you, baptisms afresh of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but you are ready, even before getting to that, which that matters, it's important, but even before that, all of you, Regardless of where you at, are at and how long you've been walking with the Lord, all of you have so much more already than you realize. So much more than you think. And the task of the enemy is to come and push back against the reality of your identity. To push back against who you really are in him. All of you are called. All of you are equipped. 
all of you are to be on the front lines. The prophet Joel makes this abundantly clear to us. When he's speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and we're living in that kingdom age, we're in that dispensation right now, not way off in the future, and not limited to some epoch in the past. Now, we're living in it now. In the age of the dissension of Holy Spirit, we're living in that right now. And Joel, again, is abundantly clear. He says that the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he'll be poured out on all flesh. That word all in Hebrew, it's very fascinating. It means all. (laughs) He'll be poured out on all flesh. And then he goes on. And the Lord already, through Joel, is pushing against this train of thought that the enemy wants us to get stuck in. That some of us are called to do it and some are not. So he begins to speak through Joel and go ahead and preemptively push back against this lying mindset that the enemy perpetuates. And so Joel says he'll be poured out on all flesh, and he takes it further, reiterates it by saying he'll be poured out on the sons and the daughters. The sons and the daughters will prophesy. It's interesting how many still believe that only the sons will prophesy when Joel says the sons and the daughters will prophesy. I think we should take the Bible at face value. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The old men will dream dreams, and the young men will see, receive, and move in visions. So what's he doing? First, Joel is addressing gender issue. He says, nope, sons and daughters, both are filled with the Holy Spirit and the spirit of prophecy as an extension of that. And this is set up, by the way, before we get into words of knowledge, because we have to establish the fact that all of you are called to do this. You really are. Sons and daughters will prophesy. And then he addresses an age issue. He says, nope, the old and the young, all are to participate in revival. The old and the young. And then he addresses any issue of class. He says, on the servants and the handmaidens. So he goes all the way from the highest echelon to what were the people that were considered the least of these in their day. He says, nope, even on the ones that you look at and you pass over them. People always look for Saul when God looks for David. The ones that you pass over, even on those, I'm pouring out my spirit. So all of us are called to do this, all right? Introduction is over. We'll jump now into words of knowledge, teaching, theological portion for just a little bit, stories, and then we're going to minister. So there are several several verses that are very important to mention regarding words of knowledge. Uh, there are three initially that are in 1 Corinthians that I'm going to run through quickly here. The first is in 1 Corinthians, of course, written by Paul to the church at Corinth, chapter 12 and verse 1. And what Paul begins to tell them here, as Paul's giving a setup, uh, he, this is sort of like Paul giving a course on spiritual gifts. And so 1 Corinthians 12.1 Sisters, I don't want you, I have no desire for you to be unaware or have any ignorance about spiritual reality. So Paul's setup is him saying this. Okay, guys, first of all, before we get into any other territory, you can't be unaware of the fact that you are coexisting here on the earth because you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 6. Galatians, Romans, and later in First and Second Corinthians, this language of our position in Christ is repeated again and again and again by Paul. You're seated with him in heavenly places, so he can't be unaware of... Oh, thank you. Should I swap? You can't be unaware of spiritual realities. Don't be ignorant of the fact that you're coexisting in a spiritual realm. See, we, we lose sight of this often, but this is really just, you know, as funny as this may sound to say, this is just like a meat suit. You're a spiritual being inhabiting a fleshly body, but you're not fleshly first and foremost. You're spiritual beings. Spiritual beings seated with Christ in heavenly places while we are existing and living, dwelling, doing life here on this earth. So Paul's setup is, have that as your foundation. Remember 
that you are spirit. And as such, don't be unaware of spiritual realities. He's reminding them also of this, this fact that you're in the middle of a, of a, a battle zone, so to speak. The ultimate war has been won through the cross was Jesus planting the flag of the kingdom of God in the earth and saying, this has been reclaimed for my father. That's what the cross was, the planting of a victory flag. But we still have messes because the enemy is very stubborn. He doesn't like to give up things very easily. And so while the war ultimately has been won, you and I are still soldiers cleaning up the messes and the battles. And part of that battle is us engaging with Holy Spirit, doing the works of the kingdom of God to destroy the works of the devil. So Paul sets us up in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, and he goes further, and he's reminding them of the fact that at one time, before they came into the kingdom, he says, you were led astray to different manners of paganism, and you were brought to mute idols. Why does Paul say that? Because he, again, wants to remind them of the fact that the God that they serve, the God that we serve, is not a mute idol. He's not a mute idol. So once again, if we take the Bible at face value, we have zero concept of a God with closed ears and a God with a closed mouth and a God with closed eyes. We have quite the opposite. We have a God who hears. We have a God who sees all things, knows all things, omniscient, omnipresent. And a God who sent his word, living word, in the person of Jesus, with Hebrews, by the way, when the author is saying that the word of God is living and active, that's sharper than any two-edged sword, that has a dualistic meaning. It's not just talking about the Bible. It's speaking about Jesus himself. He is the word who is living and active. And he cuts through bone and marrow, pierces the heart. He's sharper than any two-edged sword. Paul's reminding us He's not a mute idol. He speaks. He speaks. And if he speaks, I want to know what he's saying. I want to know what he's saying. Because he doesn't only tell me things for me, as important as that is, as necessary as intimacy with God is. He doesn't just do it for me. But again, we're beneficiaries to be benefactors. Everything that he gives us is to be given away. And as we give, the more that we give, the more is given back to us. We shower people with the grace of the Holy Spirit that God pours out onto us, and God just fills us back up and fills us back up and fills us back up and fills us back up in this beautiful exchange that happens again and again. So if we continue to go down into 1 Corinthians 12, 8, this is where in the list of the nine charismata that Paul gives us here, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, if uh, some of you aren't aware, by the way, that word for the gifts in Greek, I was joking earlier about the Hebrew all meaning all. This is literal. This isn't kidding. <clears throat> this word charis means grace. They're grace gifts, which is important because we forget often another tactic of the enemy is to make us lose sight of the fact that they're spiritual gifts and to make us think they're spiritual rewards. Or that they're gifts of merit, not gifts of grace. Or sometimes that they're gifts of the law. That they're gifts of performance. That they're gifts of striving. Not things to be received, coming before a good father with an open hand. I mentioned Luke 11 earlier in verse 20. If we go earlier up, a few verses earlier in the chapter, there's an important parable. I may speak on this more tomorrow that Jesus gives us in um, following this parable about persistence and coming and asking and seeking and knocking and not giving up. He goes on to speak further about the nature of the Father, the character of the Father, and the nature of the kingdom of God because the kingdom is the king's domain. We can't have a concept of the kingdom that's separate from the king. The essence of the kingdom is the essence of the king. And so what Jesus goes on to say is, if you're earthly and carnal and evil, and even those in that setting know how to give good gifts to their children, how much more should we expect the father to give 
to those of us who ask. And we can't ask for something good from him and get something bad. You can't ask for holiness and get unholiness. That's important to mention as well because, uh, and I know I'm reviewing many things that for some could be very basic, but it's important because people are coming from many different settings most of the time. And again, no matter how far we walk, none of us are ever experts. A lot of people think they're experts, but none of us are ever experts. And the moment we think we become an expert, God will do a really good job of bringing something humbling. He'll do a really good job of that. He's very smart. He's very smart. He's much more of an expert than we are. <clears throat> so all that to say, it's very important to remember that they're gifts of grace. You don't earn them. You don't step into them from works. And it's important to remember that God wants to lavish these things upon you more than you want to receive them. He really is that good and that loving. God wants to see people saved and healed and delivered more than I do, more than any of us ever could. He wants it that much more. So when we come before him, what I'm trying to do in this, or still a little bit of the introduction, I suppose, <clears throat> you're thinking, this is a long introduction. It's, we'll shift in a moment. <clears throat> What we can think many times is that as we come to the Lord, he's reluctant to give us things that we desire. And so we view him many times with a closed hand, and we think when we come to him through our prayers and petitions, we're doing this. We're trying to pry things out of his stingy hand. That's a tactic of the enemy. That's a lie of the enemy. Because what that produces in us, if we buy into that lie of the enemy, that he's stingy, it produces shame. What does shame do? Adam and Eve, fig leaves. Hiding yourself. Hiding your nakedness, if you will. Hiding, laying your heart bare before the Lord coming before him in honesty, but with anticipation, with expectation. Is this, okay? Is this making sense? Okay, good. <clears throat> so they're spiritual gifts. They're not spiritual rewards, okay? We'll move along to another verse I want to touch on quickly here regarding words of knowledge and the gifts of the Spirit in particular. And we've just mentioned verse 1 and verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 12. Two chapters later, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Paul is writing to them, and he tells them this, follow the way of love and eagerly desire. I want everybody to repeat that after me. Eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy for anyone who speaks in a tongue, does not speak to people but to God. And he goes on to essentially elaborate on the fact that when people come in to the midst of a community in Christ and they witness forth telling or foretelling prophetic ministry or words of knowledge, which is part of prophecy. It's under the banner of the gifts of revelation. When unbelievers, Paul says, witness that, they fall on their face and they say, surely God is in this place because secrets of the heart are being revealed and power, dynamic power from the spirit is at work. <clears throat> He's not saying ignore tongues or that tongues isn't important. That's not the point that Paul's making. Uh, he, well, anyway, let me can't, can't go there. <clears throat> Paul's not trying to diminish tongues. He's trying to call people and exhort people to pursue the prophetic expression of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And what's important here is to remember that Corinth was not a healthy church. They were not even mature in nearly everything in terms of kingdom living in loving each other and respecting each other, admonishing each other, spurring each other on. There was all sorts of immorality. They were very messed up. It's interesting that Paul doesn't say, wait until you become much more mature and then desire the gifts. While they're yet in the middle of their mess, Paul says, pursue the gifts. Pursue them. Now, there are many different reasons why I think that is. One of them 
is if you're legitimately moving in the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you're in the midst of his presence and his anointing. And I believe Paul understood how can we expect people to be transformed apart from the presence of the Spirit and his anointing and his power. Paul understood, if I dissuade them from the gifts because of lack of maturity, I am removing them from the only vehicle that can produce maturity, which is the anointing of the Lord himself. There's a few other verses I want to share some stories with you and tell you about the primary ways of words of knowledge come. The next thing I want to mention to you uh, is another one of Paul's letters to the Roman church, Romans 10, 17. And depending on what translation of scripture you're reading, the wording of this will vary just a bit. But especially for any of you who have been in church for any number of years, uh, most of you have probably heard this passage referenced, preached on. I remember hearing many, many, many different sermons on Romans ten seventeen, And the way that most translations will give verbiage to this, at least in the English language, is uh, fairly inaccurate. And the way that this is typically taught is inaccurate. And why it's important to understand what Paul is really saying is because it shifts our paradigm of the understanding of faith and the importance of the gifts of revelation, the gift of the word of knowledge, the prophetic gifts flowing, and the way that faith is produced. So the way that I always heard Romans, Romans 10, 17 taught, whether that be entire messages, people alluding to it, was that faith comes through hearing with our natural ears and through hearing the word of God. Now, the word of God, I think we would all say, is a big deal. When you say that, word of God is a big deal. We're all to be not necessarily large T, but small T theologians. We're all to be Bereans, to search the scriptures, to know the scriptures, to know the word of God. Absolutely. The logos, this is referred to in the Greek, is essential. But Paul is not referring to the hearing of physical ears in this passage, and he's not referring to the written word. What Paul is saying here, in the original language and in the context of his writing, is that faith comes to us, again, received as a gift. You can't work yourself into faith. That's very important. Because regardless of culture, there is a prevailing sentiment that if I can only work up enough, if I can pray enough, if I can fast hard enough, and again, I'm not saying, please don't leave, and, and if somebody that's not here says, how was the message? Oh, it was amazing. You know, I thought... I thought we had to do all these spiritual disciplines, and Brian just said, we don't have to ever fast. We don't ever have to pray. We just don't have to do anything. It was very freeing. That's not what I'm saying. Very much not what I'm saying. All of those things, the spiritual disciplines, essential. But that's not how you come into faith, particularly what Paul is referring to here as the grace gift of faith that we receive that is the precursor to supernatural movements of the Spirit. You can't pray hard enough in tongues to, to step into that type of faith. Now, I, in many ways, uh, you know, I, I think while I was born in North America, I probably should have been born in London. I typically don't have the problem of trying to work myself up enough into faith I'm very calm most of the time. <clears throat> but we minister in a lot of cultures that are very opposite. Latin America, for example, Brazil in particular. Uh, we do, I don't know how many meetings in Brazil every year. And one of the things that we have to do quite a bit of work with people in regarding the healing ministry is that there's a prevailing mindset that if we pray loud enough, if we pray hard enough, and if we pray long enough, if we shout enough in tongues, we'll be able to believe. God will pour out grace if we can work it up enough, if we can be fervent even all the more, break a sweat, run laps around the building, 
do cartwheels and backflips, and if we do all this stuff, we'll be able to come into faith. That's not what the New Testament tells us. And I don't know about you, but I'm very glad it doesn't tell me that I have to do cartwheels and backflips. And now if the Holy Spirit comes and he falls on people and they start doing backflips, hey, that's fun. But I'm glad I don't have to do a backflip to receive faith. It comes as a gift. So Paul is saying here, literally in the Greek, it's saying this. Faith comes through spiritual hearing. Now, of course, we hear with our ears when words of knowledge are coming. We hear it. But it's more than this. It's more than something in the natural. There is a spiritual reality. Back to 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, be aware of this. A spiritual component, a change is taking place when the gifts of revelation are flowing. Faith comes through spiritual hearing, and then he uses this language. And that spiritual hearing is this word, consummated in us through not the logos, Paul says the rhema word of Christ. So he's saying, and this again, it changes the paradigm of how we understand faith as it relates to the word of God, the active dynamic word of God through the prophetic gifts, and how we step into healing. Now, what I also don't want anyone to to walk away and think, and what I always try to remember to be careful to say is we, when I say we, myself, Camden, Dr. Randy Clark, none of us within Global Awakening believe in any way, shape, or form that you have to receive a word of knowledge for healing to flow. We don't believe that, but we believe it helps, that it helps a lot. That's one of the greatest helpers to us receiving faith and us being able to part with the Spirit to see that consummation of faith happen in others as they hear the word. Not only within a congregational setting, in a church setting, but out on the streets. I cannot tell you, I literally can't tell you, thousands, how many people I've seen saved or healed or delivered of demonic spirits outside the church through words of knowledge. People whose hearts are entirely closed to the things of God. And it's important, again, to remember to remember who Paul is, the type of language that he's choosing to give. And other passages search, such as um, 1 Corinthians 4.20, when he's very clear, he couldn't be more explicit, that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. When Paul says things like, when I came to you, I came in weakness and in much trembling, in the demonstration of the Spirit's power, I didn't come in human wisdom. Why is it important that Paul says that? It's important, for, first of all, on its foundational level. But if we go further and remember who Paul is, Paul was the greatest rhetorician of his time. Paul could out-preach anyone alive in his day. He was a senior t- student under the tutelage of Gamaliel, considered the greatest rabbi and one of the greatest philosophers living in his day. Paul was a genius. And despite his genius, despite his verbal ability, he says, yeah, it doesn't rest on that. It rests in the power of the Spirit. It rests in the power of the Spirit. And that's important because otherwise what we flip into is believing that it's about what we can do. Again, how we can perform. And the power of the Spirit, the beautiful thing about it, is you can be Paul, the greatest orator, preacher, theologian of his time, or you can be a child and move in the power of the Spirit. And this isn't just theory. This, we see this around the world in meetings with young, I'm, and five, six, seven-year-olds. Some of the most powerfully accurate prophetic words I've received have been from young children. They're not theologians. They don't have a PhD in systematic theology. But they can hear from God. Why? Because it's a free gift. It's a free gift. So Romans 10, 17 is telling us that when the word of God comes, when revelation comes forth, we're literally impregnated with faith like a seed. And when we take that and we act on it, and this type, this train of thought that Paul gives is not only Romans 10, 17, it's in Romans 15, 19, Romans 15, 13, 15, 22, many, many, many other passages, not only within Romans, but in First and Second Corinthians, in the language that Paul reiterates again and again in the New Testament, we could pull from James uh, and his 
tying together between faith and action, faith and works. Not that you're saved or justified by them, but works follow you if you're a believer. Fruit follows you. You don't have to pursue it necessarily. You pursue Jesus, and then the gifts flow. They follow you as you follow him. But Paul gives this language again and again and again that faith is connected to action. Faith is not passive. Think of your, yourself and your walk with God. You're being led by the Spirit like the steering of a vehicle. It's very hard to, to drive a parked car. Faith is tied to action. If I say that I believe something, my life should reflect that. My words, the things I say, should reflect that. And Second Corinthians one twenty is two other verses that I'll mention here, and then we'll flip into stories and the ways that words of knowledge come. We'll have ministry and demonstration <clears throat> at the end. Two other verses. Well, forgive me, I accidentally lied to you. Three other verses. And then we'll transition. <clears throat> Before Second Corinthians, I want to mention another point on this passage in Romans 10, 17, that faith is something that comes to us, and then from faith, picture it like this. Let's say, now I'm not moving in words of knowledge at the moment, but let's say I am. Picture that when I speak, there is a blue line that we can't see, but let's just say in the spiritual realm, no, I don't believe there is a blue line, it's just an illustration. Picture a blue line coming from my mouth as the rhema word comes forth. That's the word that produces faith. And it's able to produce faith because of a second layer, let's say a a different shade of blue or whatever, layer is on top of that additional line, and that's grace. And most of the time when we hear teaching on the subject of grace, it's only in two of its three dimensions. Either forgiveness of sins, and think about this. If Jesus was a man full of grace, as Scripture tells us it he was, if grace was limited to the component of the forgiveness of sins, how was Jesus full of grace when he was sinless? Jesus was full of grace. We hear forgiveness, and we hear grace is unmerited favor, but the primary expression of grace in the New Testament is a third component that we usually don't hear elaborated on, and that is power. Grace as divine enablement. So that when the word comes, it's not just a word that's empty or void of power. It's empty and void of power if it's my own words. But if it's the word of the Lord coming through his people, what rests on it is operational power. Grace rests on the word. So that upon the hearing and the receiving of the word, that grace enables you to step into, whether it's a deliverance, a healing, a supernatural act, what you could never do in your own strength previously before hearing that word. So grace doesn't just call. Grace calls you and gives you the ability to do what it calls you to do. So the first verse out of these next three is Matthew 14. And uh, actually the specific passage is eluding me, but it's in the 14th chapter of Matthew's gospel. We're familiar with this account of Peter walking on the water. But something happens before Peter is able to do this. As Jesus is standing afar off in the midst of the waves, he speaks to Peter one word. He says, come. Come to me, Peter. So this is what I want to say to you. Peter didn't just walk on the water. Peter walked on the word come. No matter how much, again, Peter willed it, Peter could not have worked himself into enough of a fervor to walk on the water. What's very interesting is after the resurrection, Jesus spends 40 days appearing to his disciples, and among them is Peter. Peter, in the midst of being disillusioned, goes back and he's fishing, and Jesus again is standing on the shore, but there's something different. He doesn't speak this word, come, but Peter witnesses him, and it's only a short time earlier that He's witnessed Jesus while he's in a boat, and he's able to walk on water. Now, Peter was a professional fisherman. So, contextually, with that in mind, his actions make no sense here. 
he sees Jesus standing on the shore. Does anyone remember what he does? He cries out, it's the Lord. And he grabs his coat. Now, a lot of us now, we have these modern, lightweight, water-resistant, nice, fancy jackets. They were wearing pig hides and bear skins and goat skins and camel skins. These coats weighed 20 to 30 pounds, some of them. It's like, a, a, if, imagine skinning a bear and putting the bearskin rug around your back before swimming. <laughs> Completely illogical. But it's not illogical if the last time you see him and step out of the boat, you walk. What's the difference? Preemptively, Jesus doesn't speak this word that carries the grace to step into that type of supernatural manifestation. So Peter sees him, decides to put on his coat, and he jumps out of the boat, Kaplunk sinks. And I imagine after that he took the coat off so he could swim to shore. Maybe he toughed it out. Maybe he just swam with the coat. We don't know. But again, is this making sense? What's the difference? In the other account, in Matthew 14, the difference is a word comes from Jesus that gives Peter the ability to do what he could not do prior to the reception of this word. Because grace rests on the rhema word of God that produces faith within not only the giver of the word, but in the hearer, to step into what it is that the grace is calling you to step into. The next two verses here are both in 2 Corinthians. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. In this verse, Paul is quoting David, and David's quote, I forget which psalm in particular, it may come back to me in a moment, but he's quoting one of the Davidic psalms in the beginning of Second uh, Corinthians 4.13, and what David says, the quote from David is this, it is written, I have believed, contextually, God. therefore I have spoken. What's that giving us again? Faith, action. Faith, action. I believed in him, and so I've made a declaration. I've given a decree based on his word because I believe in his word. So I will now act as an ambassador of the one who's spoken. I'm representing him to what it is that is around me. Regardless of what the circumstances present, what has he said? So David says, I have believed and therefore I have spoken. So Paul continues to reiterate it, takes it further, gives it to the Corinthians here, and now to us as a modern audience, as the church here in our, in our day, Paul goes on and he said, in the same spirit of faith, we too believe and therefore we speak. So once again, he's, he's, he's trying. If you notice, Paul is very repetitious in his language. He's driving home these same points again and again and again and again and again and again. Why does he do it so much? Because he knows how hard the enemy fights against it. So he's wanting to make sure that we, we never go too far at all in the writings of Paul, without these two concepts coming up again and again. You hear, obey. Hear, obey. Hear, obey. Faith, action. Faith, action. Faith, action. We're called again to be an army, a militant people. What we're not called to do is to live again on the sidelines as bench warmers. None of us are called into the kingdom to then just sit in a recliner with our legs kicked up, and just say, okay, God, anything you want to give me, anything you want to use me for, I'm open to it. I'm open. Here I am. I'm open. It's a lie from the enemy that God is simply after me being open. He's not after me being open. He wants brokenness of heart, not openness of heart. Now, in the positive sense of the word brokenness, Obviously, Isaiah 61, reiterated in Luke, Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted. You guys understand when I use that word, right? In the positive sense, a broken heart and a contrite spirit, that's what he's after. He wants you to be obsessed with the promises that he's given. To be like Jacob in Genesis, and after he's wrestling with the angel of the Lord, he doesn't say, well, if you want to bless me, yeah, that's okay. Otherwise, you know, see you later. Stop by, by another day. He says, I won't let go of you until you bless me. 
That's the heart he's after. A heart that is set ablaze. A heart that's burning for the promises of the Spirit of God. That's what he's looking for. We believe and therefore we speak. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, this is our last verse of the evening before we transition into the ways, words, and knowledge can come, stories that we minister. And if I do go too long, somebody throw a shoe at me or something. And but I only do So I want to make sure to maximize our time together and pour out as much as I can. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians 1.20, we've just looked at 4.13. We're going two chapters earlier. Paul is writing here, and he tells us this. He says, for no matter how many promises, you think about the weight of these words, no matter how many promises God has made, no matter how many. Now, let's take even prophetic promises that he's given us in our day. Let's put those on the shelf, set them aside, and let's take just what we have in the written word alone, thousands of promises that he's given us. Paul says it doesn't matter how many he's made, they're yes in Christ. They're not yes and no. And again, we often come to the Lord like he, his heart is, what's the name of that flower? A dandelion. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Today it's yes. Today he's no. God is not bipolar. Hebrews also tells us, in whom there is no shadow of turning. Today, yesterday, and forever, the same. He doesn't operate the way that we do. There's no fickleness. He's never tossed to and fro. He's steadfast. Paul's being abundantly, abundantly clear here. They are yes. And through him, he's not saying it's through our power, but he does say something that we do. He says, through him, the amen, does anyone know what amen means? Let it be. Let it be. And somewhere around England, they wrote a great song with that name. Let it be. Amen means let it be. So the let it be, the amen, is spoken. Interestingly, Paul doesn't say the amen is spoken by the Lord. He says the promises are yes, they're assured, there is a bedrock that you can stake your life on here. But the amen to those promises is spoken by us to the glory of God. So the glory of God is in revealed. The power of God, the works of God, the supernatural expression of the kingdom comes as the fruit of us giving an amen to his yes. Think about it like this. Remember the picture we're given in Genesis of the Holy Spirit brooding, hovering over the waters before the initiation of the entirety of creation. God's promises are hovering over you and I. That's his yes. In the yielding of our life to what he's declared as a yes, in that amen, the amen, the let it be, and the yes of God kiss. And that's when glory is unfolding. It's when those two things come together. Because God is not interested in robots. He wants lovers and friends. John 15, 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't have any knowledge of what his master is doing. But I call you my friends. He wants friendship. He doesn't want forced coercion. He wants partners. We're co-laborers with Christ. It's not that God has to have humans do anything. Out of his sovereignty, he chooses to. He says, what I'm doing with my will is I'm going to allow my people to surrender their will to mine, to partner with me. And as we do that, we see the kingdom come. End of the introduction. Now I'm going to tell you quickly the ways that words of knowledge come and a few stories that we're going to have ministry time and demonstration. <clears throat> there are seven main ways over the years, particularly beginning around 1970, when 
Uh, and it's not that words of knowledge didn't exist in the 1970s rolled around and you had movements like the Vineyard and John Wimber and other individuals that were very prominent in the charismatic Pentecostal scene in the church, the Catholic charismatic scene within the church. And then around 1970, God said, you know, I'm going to give a new gift of the Spirit. Try out words of knowledge. And we'll see if you have a good run with that. That's not what God was doing. They existed all the way into the Old Testament. They weren't called words of knowledge. But you, in the New Testament, we're given this language that as we hear from God, as people who are participants of the mind of Christ, word of, a word of knowledge is simply something you could not know in the natural. God tells it to you. That's what a word of knowledge is. And that exists all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So it wasn't something new, but it was something that not a lot of people really sat and wrote at length about and dissected. And you see God do this again and again and again in church history, is that truths have existed for millennia. But what God does is raises up people and movements to take the truth that's always existed in him and say, I'm going to use this man, this woman, this movement to breathe upon this truth and sort of resuscitate it, resurrect it for the body. Because it's existed, but my people aren't understanding it the way that they ought. And so, beginning in around 1970, an individual by the name of John Wimber, many of you may have heard of, uh, at one time, I believe into the early 80s, the vineyard movement was really making tremendous waves uh, within, within the UK. Thank you. <clears throat> and it wasn't limited to the vineyard, but it was one of the primary expressions all those years ago that God began to use to bring about an understanding of words of knowledge back to the church. And all the way from then until now, and we're still learning. Again, none of us are experts. I, I, I don't have a number for how many words of knowledge I've given, not only uh, accurately, inaccurately. By the way, that's very important to understand that you're never going to be 100% right, and that's okay. If we were, we would have no need to rely on him. And that's, again, very important to reiterate because another lie from the enemy is once you're perfect, you can start to do this. Not true. Not true. God takes your weakness and pulls strength from it. God is actually, believe it or not, attracted to weaknesses in you. God's attracted to flaws within you. In this context, he doesn't look for people who are proud and think, I'm always going to bat a thousand and get it right every time. He looks for humbleness of heart and people who are just willing to say, I'll trust you. I'm not always going to get it right, but I don't have to. Earthly thinking is, what if I'm not hearing from God and what if this is just me and I, I, I fall on my face and I look foolish? But heavenly thinking, kingdom thinking, is what if it's not me, what if I am hearing from God and I could change this person's life? That's the way God wants us to think. So there are seven main ways that we've learned over the years the words of knowledge can come. I'm going to tell you what they are quickly, and we'll unpack them before we minister. <clears throat> the seven primary ways we've learned they can come. Number one, you can feel them. Number two, you can think them. Number three, you can see them. You can read them. You can say them. Number six, dream them. And number seven, experience them. And that was rather quick, so now we're going to back up. We'll unpack it. All right, the first way, you can feel them in your physical body. Uh, this can happen in three different ways. You can feel physical pain. You can feel a sensation. It's not a pain, but it's a sens sensation. And you can also feel them within your emotions. Now we'll unpack those three of the dimensions of the way that you can uh, feel them. Feeling them in your physical body is probably the easiest to explain and the fastest to explain. Uh, and what's going to happen, not only after tonight, but especially after tomorrow morning, for everyone that could be here for impartation when we pray for you, lay hands on you, and this isn't saying it as any boast in and of ourself. It's boasting in the track record of the Holy Spirit, His faithfulness, 
to pour out this grace upon people everywhere we go, every meeting we do around the world, historically, and that he continues to do to this day. It's boasting in him. God's going to do this. If you've not moved in words of knowledge before, after tonight and tomorrow morning in particular, they're going to start to happen to you. And for many of you, this feeling dimension will be one of the main ways that they're opened up. Now, you can feel them, again, in your physical body. You can feel pain that is not your pain. So uh, let's say, how do you pronounce it? Little? L-I-D, the grocery store? Yeah. We, we've got walked over back and forth a little a few times. <clears throat> we don't have that yet that I know of in uh, the U.S., but I've heard we're having one soon near where we live. Anyway, this isn't a sermon about little. So say you're walking through Little, or what's the other store we went to? Morrison's. You're walking through Morrison's, you're walking through Little, you're walking through um, Asda. What it, I don't know. You get the point. You're walking through. You pass by someone, you're feeling great, you've had good sleep, you're not having any physical issues, let's say, and I pass by Judah, Judah's shopping in Little. He's looking for chicken nuggets. <laughs> and I walk past Judah. And all of a sudden, my shoulder, when I go to move it, just cramps up. Now, if you have something wrong with your shoulder, that's not unusual. It's probably flaring up due to one thing or another. But let's say you don't have any issue with your shoulder. I want to encourage you act on those things. More often than you realize, the Lord is speaking to you through highlighting. We also will, will sometimes refer to this as sympathetic pains by the Spirit. He'll let you feel things and discern things in your body that you don't have, but that a person has. And they often happen outside of here when you pass by or get close to someone. I've actually, it's something that I'll coach people with often is they say, well, how do I know it's the Lord? Ultimately, you have to risk, and without risk, you'll never have growth, or you'll have very minimal growth. The individual that I'm speaking of, John Wimber, when he would speak about the nature of faith, and in particular with healing, with words of knowledge, he would say this phrase, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. So you have to risk. But as on a practical level, one thing I'll tell people is, and, and I've tested this often and found it to many times be the case, I've had many occasions where I've walked near someone in this scenario, walking, passing by Judah in Little or Morrison's. My shoulder starts to hurt. I walk away and see if the pain leaves. And many times it will. And I'll come back in proximity to Judah. The pain's back. That's how, that's a way, if that happens, you really can be confident it's the Lord. That's not the way that pain works. It's not the way pain works. Does that make sense? So you can feel them in your physical body. You can feel pain that is not your pain anywhere in the body or just unusual sensations. Uh, this is important as well because many times we're used to feeling expressions of the presence of the Holy Spirit touching us in worship or in intercessory prayer and things of that nature in our prayer closet. It's getting before the Lord that can be heat, that can be cooling, that can be tingling. Uh, Sometimes people feel, um, not in a painful sense, but just in an unusual way, like pins and needles in the body. Have any of you ever been here in worship, and all of a sudden you, you feel like something is, is pressing on your hands? Anyone? No? Right here? Well, pay attention to that. Many times you'll feel things just sort of like a little pressure, like something's being placed in your hand. Sometimes you'll feel wind when there's no air conditioning. Uh, again, intense heat, tingling. Sometimes people will feel, and I'll mention these things again tomorrow before our time of impartation, sometimes people will feel numbness, like you've gone to sleep, laying on your hand, you wake up, and you have to get the blood circulating again. These types of expressions can also happen in your body that aren't painful. They're just sensations. When God is speaking to you to say, I want to heal this part of the body, you can pass by a person or stand before uh, people, for a room full of people, and 
you may feel your heart feel like it starts to beat really unusually, uh, an unusual rhythm, sometimes slowed down, sometimes speeding up. And you'll find often when you begin to engage with that person that you're near, they'll say, yeah, actually, I, I have a problem with a, some arrhythmia. I have, an, I have an abnormal heart rate. Can you pray for me? But you'll never know unless you act on it. And you can feel them in your emotions. This is vital as well because I've, I've talked through many, many people over the years that have uh, been activated in the prophetic ministry of the Holy Spirit but he's using their emotions like a canvas. But they don't know that, so they think all of a sudden I'm going crazy. And I've talked to people, and I'll say, well, why, do you, why do you, would you say that? Well, I felt great, and, you know, last Wednesday I walked into Little, and I uh, was checking out, and I was happy. I'm listening to the song that I love, and I went, and I stood next to this young woman. And when I stood next to her, I just wanted to break down in tears. Something's going on with me. When did that start? You know, it's funny. It kind of started after that meeting where you prayed for me. Oh, okay, interesting. And then when you start to prompt these people, well, how about you act on those things? They find out, I'm not going crazy. I started to talk to this woman, and come to find out she just had a death in the family. She's incredibly depressed. She's been crying and crying and crying, and I was able to minister to her and see the Lord bring healing to her heart. So you can feel them, sensations, physical pain, and emotional sensations, okay? Secondly, you can think them. Uh, now, I'm going to give you a quick exercise. Of course, this is not a word of knowledge, but it's just a, a good way to illustrate the way that um, thinking words of knowledge occurs. And by the way, this overlaps with the fact that you can see them. So I'm going to give these, we've gone through feeling. I'm going to give here thinking and seeing together because they function very similarly. The difference is in seeing them, now occasionally people will see things with their natural open eyes, but that tends to be much more rare. And that one's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, if I'm standing here and all of a sudden you look and you see something in the natural, standing here with me or, or orbiting or whatever it is, that doesn't take too much interpretation. Why? Because you can see it the way that you can see me, you can see the Bible and the pulpit and the flags. You see it with your natural eyes. Most of the time, however, you see it in what's called your sanctified imagination. And we're used to, in our modern language, imagination being something negative, typically just attributed to children, something you're making up. Biblically, that's not what imagination is. Biblically, the realm of your imagination, again, I, I mentioned this word earlier, a canvas, is like a slate within your mind on which the Lord brings names, images, all manner of things into your mind. And it functions much like the way that you experience a memory. So if you all were to think back to just this morning, what you did when you woke up, or you walked to, your routine, what you had for breakfast, what you watched on TV, what you read, <clears throat> getting dressed, the shoes you went and put on. You can see yourself in like a little movie in your mind doing that, most of you. <clears throat> That's the way that words of knowledge function when you think them, when you have thoughts come into your mind that are not your own, and those can be names. If I had not met Judah, now I, of course I now know his name in the natural, but if I walked in and all of a sudden this thought, Judah, 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 keeps coming into my mind, I could say, again, earthly thinking, huh, that's weird. I wonder why I just keep thinking the name Judah. Oh, well. Or I could think about it from the kingdom perspective. You know, that's unusual that the name Judah keeps coming to mind. I don't have any friends named Judah. I haven't read anything about the tribe of Judah. But it keeps coming into my mind. That's probably God telling me that there's a Judah nearby that I need to minister to and you'll act on it, and you'll find this to be the case more often than not. <clears throat> you can see not only names, but you can see images. And the images, again, function very similarly. So uh, that's important to mention as well because of the fact that most of the time, most of the time, when words of knowledge are occurring, and these type of spiritual gifts are flowing, it usually will not feel supernatural. 
you usually will not get goosebumps. You usually will not uh, have some sort of very demonstrative experience. It usually will just flow so subtly and in such a natural type of manner that you're tempted to think that God's not speaking to you. Because in our flesh, before we start to learn more about the ways of God, it can be so easy to think, well, there has to be something thunderous, and that's how I know it's God. I remember this is what I first thought about words of knowledge. When I got saved and I started to try and move in the gifts of the Spirit, I thought that uh, if God's going to speak to me, there's going to be an angel that comes with a shofar and blow it, get my attention, jolt me, and he'll speak to me like a Charlton Heston or Morgan Freeman. My son, go to Isle 11 in Morrison's. There's a woman named Elizabeth. Oh, there is an Elizabeth. Well, see, you see what I mean? I didn't feel any supernatural. But sometimes you're accidentally prophetic. That's fun when God does that. There's a woman named Elizabeth. These are the 11 conditions that she has in her body. And they would all rattle off, and I would say, okay. And I would have such a thunderous experience that I would be able to stand in confidence that it's the Lord. Now, sometimes he does things like that, and again, it's fun, just like the backflips are fun. If he does that, amazing. We champion that. But it usually doesn't work that way. And we have to remember these things because the enemy, again, p fights so hard to get us to resist. To get us to think, well, that can't be God. It, it, it's too simple. There's not a whirlwind. There's no fire and smoke. There's no lightning and thunder. There's no booming audible voice. There's no doves that emerge and start flying around. There's no angels and shofars. It was just a thought. God is in those thoughts. He's in the stillness and the smallness so much more than you think. In fact, most of the really tremendous healings and miracles and things that I've seen have happened in moments that were the most natural, that were through the subtlest and the smallest of thoughts and images and words, not through the most dramatic, but they brought about dramatic results through obeying the small thing. So here's a way that they could come, all right? Close your eyes. And I'm going to say something now, and most of you are going to have something flash in your mind, okay? Purple elephant. Okay? You can open your eyes. And raise your hand if even for a split second you saw a purple elephant. Most people. Now, was that a word of knowledge? No. But that's the way that images come to your mind. And in the same way that you just experienced that in the natural... In the supernatural, God will reveal images to you. And again, just pay attention to them because often they're so subtle, you're tempted to lean away from it rather than leaning into it. You may walk into a room and all of a sudden you, you for even for a split second, get a picture of an arm and a cast. And it's very easy, again, to think, oh, that's weird. But start to think, what if that's the Lord? And then start to be on the hunt. Look around, look about for the person with the arm in a cast. You may have a picture of a heart or a lung, a broken knee. Any of these things may just flash into your mind. So you can have images that you see, you can feel them, you can have thoughts. You can also read them. Now, this is very similar to what we just reviewed with the images. The difference is, for whatever reason, I don't know why God does everything the way that he does it. I'm glad I don't have to know the reasons why. We just have to learn what they are. It's interesting, in Exodus 33, there's this great exchange with Moses and with the Lord, and um, he says, it's an interaction, it's, it's a conversation, but it's also a prayer. In the 33rd chapter of Exodus, Moses says, God, teach me your ways that I would know you. And I'm so freed up and glad that Moses doesn't say, teach me your ways and give me a detailed breakdown of why you do everything that you do and why you do so many things in such a weird way. And let me understand that, and then I can know you, and then I can partner with the ways once I have a detailed explanation of all of them. I'm glad we don't have to have that, that mystery is okay. 
that his ways are higher than mine. So we don't have to know the why. I don't know why God d- gives words of knowledge in all these different ways, but we found that he does. How have we found that out? Fruit. The fruit. Which is, again, why you'll never be able to ultimately know that many of these things are the Lord until you act on it. He could give you 50 words of knowledge in this meeting, any one of you, if he wanted to. But if you keep them to yourself, you'll never know that you're hearing from the Lord. And you'll never get to see the fruit that comes as a result of your obedience. But the opposite is also true. He could give you 50 words of knowledge and you act on those and 50 healings happen. Is this still making sense? Okay. <clears throat> so you can read them. And uh, for whatever reason, again, you, this, this can occur sometimes through the Lord causing things to just sort of project in front of you as words. Uh, now, it's ordinarily not as clear as you would read this Jesus Christ is Lord banner or Exodus thirty three thirteen or the 2058 or the born to preach, Matthew 28, Mark 16. It's ordinarily not that superimposed. It's usually very light. And I found that usually this happens either with words. So let's say I'm looking out over you all as a congregation right now. And the Lord showed me this word, kidney. Okay? Um, now, he's not, uh, at least not through reading it. That could be an accidental word of knowledge that I don't know of. Someone needs healing in their kidneys. <clears throat> this happens many times in meetings, and we, we just have no idea until we get to the end and start conversing with people and finding out that oftentimes we accidentally are getting words of knowledge because, again, they feel so natural. To me, it feels like I just randomly guessed the word kidney, but someone could indeed need healing in their kidneys. <clears throat> Usually, you see them in the way that if you're out on a very hot day and you look at the pavement and the heat from the sun causes you to see this little shimmer. You perceive it, you see it, but just barely so, right? Has everyone seen that? Heat on the pavement, especially if you fly and you look out on a runway and the sun is beaming down. You see this, it's like the pavement's being cooked by the sun, this little sizzling. It's often the that's often the way that you see these words or phrases or pictures. All right, so three more ways that they can come. You can say them. Uh, this is something that many of you have probably experienced on what I call a micro level. And this, here's what I mean by saying it. You can have things come out of your mouth while you're speaking that you don't plan to say. The difference with the other ways that words of knowledge come is you can kind of get the choice of whether or not you act on it. They run through your cognition. They run through your critical thinking. They run through uh, your other senses, and you get to kind of sit and stew on it and decide, oh, am I going to act on that, or am I going to kind of keep it to myself? The difference with words of knowledge that come vocally is I could be speaking right now, and all of a sudden, blah, things just stumble out of your mouth that you don't plan to say. And many people have had this, again, on a micro level occur Uh, Through something like this, you're talking with someone, someone here, your church family, a relative, or a stranger, and all of a sudden, while you're talking to them, things just start coming out of your mouth, and you're wondering, you're hearing it as it's coming out. You're not thinking it. You're not thinking, I want to ask them how this family member is doing. You're talking to them about Morrison's, and all of a sudden, you start to say, by the way, how is uh, Emily doing? How is this cancerous condition doing? And you're thinking, what in the world? Why am I asking about that? And the person, how did you know? How did you know this was happening? How did you know this was going on? I need prayer for this exact thing. Have any of you had something like that? You're talking to someone, you're not planning it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, things will just start to come out, and you're wondering, why am I saying that? You're not thinking and sitting on it. Well, I want to ask about this. You just find yourself saying it, and you're wondering why as it's coming out of your mouth. You can have words of knowledge occur this way. Um, you can also have that this happen on not a micro, but a macro level through sometimes some pretty dramatic statements that the Lord will just cause to rush out of your mouth. Now, it is scary when this happens. I'll forewarn you. I'll also forewarn you, before this meeting, before every meeting I do, I pray and ask God, when we pray for the people, start to do this with them. And you may not have wanted me to pray that for you, but I prayed it anyway. But I'm warning you. Uh, that it is oftentimes a little bit unsettling when they come. There's tremendous power behind it. 
there's tremendous power behind it. Uh, and it's one of the primary ways that words of knowledge come for me personally is through spontaneous speech. <clears throat> the final two ways, you can dream them, pretty self-explanatory, you go to sleep, you have a dream. Uh, here's just a, a quick little tip. Uh, if the dream is very weird, often that's a sign that there's something prophetic to it. Not always. You know, for all the prophetic dreams I have, I have three times as many pizza dreams. <laughs> but it's important to pay attention. And sometimes God will give things in a way that's abundantly clear, what's undeniable that it's him. And I want to also encourage you, write them down. Write them down. It took me years before I started listening to my own advice. As I, I'm as stubborn as anybody else. I wouldn't write them down. I would have people come and prophesy to me. The Lord says, write down your dreams. Okay, I know he's saying that. And I wouldn't write them down. Just out of laziness. But it wasn't being a good steward. When you steward things well, you get more. Write them down. You will forget most of them if you don't write them down. Words and knowledge can come in your dreams. And finally, through... Uh, unusual, we're still learning that they can come. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, God will often speak to you through bizarre circumstances. And again, the easy thing to do, what you're going to initially in your flesh feel led to do is to toss it aside and just chalk it up to a weird thing that happened to you. Now, sometimes weird things just happen, especially to me. For some reason, I'm like a magnet for weird things. I don't know why. Now, I, I believe it's not, I was talking with Camden a little bit earlier because uh, I didn't get to be here with you this morning about some of your background and some things that many of you are familiar with, some people you're familiar with. Uh, I want to check again for this group tonight and for all of you that are going to get to be here tomorrow. How many of you are familiar with uh, Dr. Clark, Dr. Randy Clark? I think there was a few of you that are familiar with Dr. Randy Clark <coughs> in the Ministry of Global Awakening. Uh, before I did this full-time on my own, and then later with, with Camden. Uh, I, starting with my first trip, I was about 18 years old, uh, used to travel with Dr. Clark around the world. When it came towards the end of uh, my time with him, actually before our last trip that we had together, we were going to be in Virginia. And I had about six days before leaving on this trip. And uh, in the six days, I just had rest time. I didn't have really any responsibilities at the time other than traveling with Arthur Clark. <clears throat> and I'm telling you that because of this. When I, I went to a uh, grocery store near where I lived in Pennsylvania at the time, in downtown Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, I walked to this grocery store. I'm at the counter. I'm checking out. And I look up, and the uh, young woman checking me out at the register, her name tag says Leilani. At the time, I had not met anyone ever with the name Leilani. And I thought, that's a really pretty name. I said, I love your name. She said, thank you. And I left. In the next five days, I met seven other women named Leilani. That's unusual. Not so unusual if, number one, it was a much more common name. It's not a very common name, especially around that area of Pennsylvania. And secondly, it was unusual because I had never, to my recollection, met anyone with that name my whole life. And now I meet seven of, well, seven, eight of them in five days in that vicinity. Now, I didn't know for sure that that was the Lord, but I thought, let's experiment. Let's test this out. So I wrote down that little encounter in my phone. We get to Virginia, and it's time for the meeting. It's a Sunday morning. Randy and I are on the stage, we're ministering, we're giving words of knowledge, and I quickly explained what I just explained to you, and so I said, is there anyone here named Leilani? And uh, we're in a big church, maybe a thousand plus people in Virginia, and there was a woman on, uh, I forget, the first or the second row. She jumps up, that's me, I'm Leilani, and she runs out. And I thought, she must think I'm going to start to call out sin in her life or something. I'm Leilani. Runs out of the, of the church, out into the hole. I never had anyone do that before. So I turned and I looked at Randy. What do we do? And he said, I don't know. You had the word, not me. <laughs> what do we do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I've never had anyone do that before. 
So I just said, well, I, I don't know what to do. We'll just keep going. And I gave the rest of the words of knowledge. We're praying for people. Now, here's how good God is. She was completely healthy, had nothing wrong with her. She's probably, I guess, about 28, 29 years old. <clears throat> but her father, who was there, who had multiple sclerosis and was mostly deaf, was there in the building, but he wasn't in the service. He was outside the sanctuary, out in the hall. So God gave me the name of his daughter because God foreknew this man, I think, believe his name was Harold, won't be in the service. If I give Brian his name, it won't do any good. He won't be sitting in there to hear it. But I'll get his attention with the name of his daughter because his daughter is going to be in the meeting. So when his daughter heard her name, she made a connection. I may be okay, but my dad is not okay. God is singling me out to get to him. So she ran out to go get her father. So she brings him into the meeting. We pray for Harold, and God heals the deafness and heals the MS. <clears throat> because he's good. Because he's incredible. One more story, and then we're going to minister. <clears throat> and this one is not only an illustration of what can happen when you see them, but it's to reiterate the importance of taking risk, regardless of how inferior you may feel in the moment, risk anyway, risk anyway, inside and outside the church. <clears throat> and you'll see so much more happen. But the enemy will fight you to not do it. Don't let him win. Don't let him win. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. <clears throat> and you'll take background for the enemy. So uh, I'm also sharing this because it happened um, about four hours away from here in uh, Wolverhampton in 2017, I believe January. I was here uh, in Wolverhampton with Dr. Clark, and uh, we were at a large church, I believe called Lighthouse Church, and we, we had visited several places, at Holy Trinity, Brompton, and a number of other churches, and uh, this was one of our last stops. And we're at this church, and um, it, it was pretty large, a couple thousand people were in the meeting, a beautiful sanctuary, everybody was dressed in suits, and beautiful dresses, and I was probably wearing something about like this, and uh, I was younger than everybody there. I felt very intimidated, and we got into the ministry time, and Randy was standing and giving words of knowledge, and I knew in a few moments he was going to be calling on me to give words of knowledge. I had written down several on my phone. I felt scared to give all of them, and uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to look so foolish in front of all these people if I get these wrong, but I'm pretty sure that I'm hearing from the Lord on these. Uh, some of them I feel really co fairly confident. And all of a sudden, as I'm standing there, now on the inside, I'm, like, I'm, I'm a mess. My heart is just, I'm shaking. And on the outside, I'm trying to look very composed. Think about it like that. <clears throat> and I'm waiting, I'm looking out over the people, and all of a sudden, as I'm looking, just like a flash, I see this word, compound word, photophobia. Photophobia. And I saw that, and at first I'm kind of thinking, like, you know, our eyes are playing tricks on you. You're still suffering jet lag. You know, you're, you're, that's not the Lord. And what would that even be if it was the Lord? I've never heard of that word. And I said, I know what a phobia is. I know what a photo is. Someone afraid of photos. Someone afraid of having their picture taken. Photophobia, what in the world could that be if it is God? And uh, as I'm sitting and I'm trying to think, well, I'll probably just push that off. I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit say, you're to give that word and give it first. Give it first. Now that made it even worse. Because if I caved in and, and decided I'm going to give it, I was going to give it at the end. I was going to say everything else that I was sure about first, build faith in the room, build confidence with the congregation, and at the end say, oh, by the way, I uh, had yeah, this little word, photophobia. No? Okay. That's what I wanted to do if I gave it. But the Holy Spirit said, no, you're to say that and say it first. And I'm thinking, No. No, God, I can't do that. Don't do that to me. I can't do that. I don't even know if that's you. 
I'm arguing. Now I'm arguing, and I'm so caught up vertically arguing with God that Randy's speaking, and all I'm hearing is wah, 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 wah. And all of a sudden, I snap out of it as he's saying, Brian, Brian, what? Give your words. Okay. Went and grabbed the microphone and kind of, I said, uh, photophobia. As soon as I said that, now again, we've got maybe 2,000, 2,100 people in the room. One person in the very last seat in the last row of the church. I didn't know what that word was. I had never heard of it. None of the rest of us knew what it was. But it turns out it's a genetic condition on a spectrum that's a bit rare that causes a hypersensitivity to light. This one woman had it the furthest end of the spectrum, as severely as you can have it. It didn't matter if it was sunlight, blue light, UV ray, headlights, any form of light. If she were to gaze into it, she would pass out and wake up for at least three to four days with a level 10 migraine vomiting and have to be alone in a dark room with no visuals and no sound. She's there in the meeting with sunglasses that are totally darkened and that are so thick it looked like ski goggles, three to four inches thick. She had that condition. So when I said photophobia, she jumps up and says, that's me, that's me, rips off the sunglasses and stares up into the headlights and starts weeping completely healed. We didn't even have to give any other words of knowledge for at least 30 or 40 minutes because the people witnessing that, her not only reaction, but the fact that they saw the kingdom broke in and healed this woman, brought the faith in the room up to such a degree that we didn't have to do anything else teaching-wise or word of knowledge-wise to, to elevate faith. God elevated it himself by what he did. And the faith of the people came up to such a high watermark that we then began to have happen what I call popcorn healings. Just one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, began to break out in the congregation. And we saw metal dissolve out of people's bodies. We saw deafness healed and blindness healed and just all manner of incredible things. And I can't tell you how many times I think back to moments like that and I wonder, what if you gave into fear and you didn't say the word? Because you thought you were gonna look stupid if you got it wrong. Now, let's say if I did get it wrong and people did think something about me. Ultimately, so what? Even if you fail in the sense of missing it, you fail unto obedience. You fail forward. I'll reference Hebrews again. We have this beautiful, long passage called the Hall of Faith, all these heroes, great men and women of God that kept pressing onward. They aren't there because they never messed up. They are there because they never stopped believing. They never stopped persevering. Their persistence never ended. They held fast to the Spirit of the Lord and to His voice despite the highs and the lows. So if you fail, fail forward. But I promise you, I've, I've seen the Lord do this enough to know you're going to be accurate a lot more than you think. A lot more than you think. And you're going to see Harich and this region transformed for the gospel through your obedience. And this is just one of the vehicles in which you do that. All right. Teaching is over. Everyone take a deep breath. Oh, I thought this guy was never going to end. Can you bring me my water, Kim, and my little electrolyte water? Thank you. <clears throat> well, we have ended with the teaching at least, all right? Now we're going to have ministry. <clears throat> and there are a few ways in which I want to go about doing this. Um, and I'm actually going to do it a little bit differently than what I was planning on doing uh, when I started. The first is this. And uh, by the way, again, this, this is not about being oriented around performance or pressure. The church should be training ground, among other things. This should be a community in which you feel safe to go for it, safe to risk. 
So I want to ask this question initially. It's the first phase of ministry time. Um, and Camden, of course, you can come up if you, if you want, if you have anything. <clears throat> during this teaching or during any time in which you've walked into the building, because we've also found often God begins to do this with people before we say a word. <clears throat> Is there anyone that thinks you might have gotten a word of knowledge during this teaching? You started to feel something unusual in any part of your body, whether that be a pain, a sensation, any, any, any type of unusual thing in your body, anywhere internally or externally, emotionally, sensation-wise, or physical pain. Is there anyone that's had a random thought that you think could be a word of knowledge? That could be a condition. That could be a date. That could be a name. Uh, oftentimes, we found people will get something, let's say, just like an April 17th. And that can be the birthday of someone there who needs healing. That can be the anniversary on which an accident occurred, an injury occurred, and the person remembers, that's when I got injured on my job, and I need to be healed. There could be any number of things. Is there anyone that's had a picture, not the purple elephant, but something else come into your mind? Now, hopefully no one's dreamed a word of knowledge during this time together. <clears throat> But does anyone think, no matter how small, that God might have given you something during this time together tonight so far? Anybody? Okay. Two, three, all right, four. Anybody else? We've got four. Going once, going twice. Okay. Interesting. All four women. Can you four stand up? Okay, five. You didn't raise your hand. That's okay. You're forgiven. <clears throat> and I think I saw your hand as well. I think so. Is that right? Or no? Just her hand. Okay. <clears throat> Are you sure you don't have anything? You don't think you have anything? I think you think you have something. And you're feeling a little bit apprehensive. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Again, it doesn't matter how small of an inkling it is. This is training. This is equipping time. This is testing. Okay? This is what I want you to do. I want all of you to come up here to the front. No, 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 not, not all of you. Those of you who are standing who, who, yeah. Those of you standing who think you may have gotten a word of knowledge. And what I want you to do is to start kind of where this chair is and horizontally here line up this way across the front facing the rest of the people. Yeah, come on up. That's okay. I, I promise I won't bite you. <clears throat> now, again, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding around. I don't want anyone to feel a pressure that you have to. But I strongly want to compel you that this is a good time to risk and to go for it. Okay. All right, is there anybody else? I think the Lord might have given you something. Okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do things in three phases here. Before I give any words of knowledge or guesses of knowledge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start over here from the left and to the right. I'm going to come down and I'm going to have them just say two things. I want you to say what you feel like the Lord is giving you, what you feel like he's showing you, and I also want you to tell me, and therefore tell everybody else, how the word came. If you felt it, I want you to, to tell us, I felt this in my body. I felt this internally. I had this thought. I saw this image. Some of you may have had it come overlapping in multiple ways. And I want you to tell us what, uh, what the word is. I think I already said that. Yeah. Tell us what it is. Tell us how it came to you. And after they do this, if you think that applies to me, or remember the story of Leilani. She was completely fine, but her father is the one who needed to be healed. You'll be astonished at how many times God will give words in a meeting that you know the person who it's for, and he gives it. Although they're not there, you are there, and you are able to stand and know that's for them. Does that make sense? Okay, so after they do this, I want you to do something for me that you may not be totally used to, and you may wonder, why are they wanting us to do that? This is kind of weird. Just trust me. 
if you have this condition that they call out, or it makes sense to you, you know who it is for, I want you to stand up after they finish giving it, okay? There is a power that comes when we are not passive. When we stand, that's one way that we say, let it be, according to your word. God looks for hearts that acknowledge him. And I'm very aware that culturally, not only where I'm from, but here, many other places I've ministered in Europe of uh, things like tall poppy syndrome. Very aware of that. Uh, And I want to tell you that's a lie from the enemy. You're not drawing attention to yourself. You're doing the opposite. You're drawing attention to God. You're drawing glory to God. You're just simply saying, Lord, we recognize this is you. Okay? So that's our first phase. We're going to do that. I'm going to give any words of knowledge that I receive, and I want you to do the same thing. If you have that, and you can sit back down. You don't have to stay standing the whole time. I don't want to make you do Christian gymnastics here. But I want you to stand, acknowledge it, and then sit back down. Unless, if it's very hard for you to stand, lift a hand up really high. Okay? And thankfully, we've got a small enough group here where we can see everybody very, very plainly, very clearly. After we do that, I'm going to pray corporately over everyone who those words apply to. And afterwards, I'm going to have everybody come up that needs prayer for healing, regardless of whether you had a word of knowledge apply to you or not. And we're going to lay hands on you uh, and pray in faith for you to be healed. Okay? All right. I'm going to start over here. And uh, I missed a piece. Actually, I want all of you to, now you all know each other, but I'm going to be getting to know you. So tell me your names. And then, you guys remember the rest? Tell us the word, and tell us how you got the word. And if that applies to you, stand. Okay? All right. Okay, you're just standing in. Okay, here we go. My name is Beata. Beata. Like Beatrice. Beata. Beata. I'm I'm not very good with... um, my different accents, and that's, I'm learning. Berta, okay. So if I me- if I fumble anything, it's not on purpose. <clears throat> All right, Berta. So tell us, what do you feel like the Lord was showing you, and then how did the word come? What I felt it was a kind of shivering. I did not feel cold, so I had no reason. So it was definitely some shivering in your whole body, or one part of the body. Shoulders, and then it run down into the back? On the right side of the back. Okay. Does anyone have any issue in one or both shoulders or the right side of the back? And even more specifically, because sometimes we'll get a word, and occasionally a part of it will be right and a part of it won't. And what, if we're understanding the ways of God and the way he works in healing, what we don't ever want to do is say, well, man, my shoulders are are a mess. They're killing me, but I don't have anything in the right side of my back. That's not me. That's what we don't want to do. What we want to do is have faith to the degree that we say, the right side of my back is fine, but I want my shoulders healed, and we stand. Okay, so does anyone have either that specifically, shoulder pain that runs into the right side of the back, or just one of those, right side of the back, or an issue in the shoulders? left shoulder. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Right here. Okay. Both shoulders. Both shoulders. Does it extend down into the back? Okay. So you're right. So you're going to have two people to minister to. All right. Amen. Now, when you heard that and you made the connection that that was you, what did you feel for both of you? Thought it may not be you. Once you realize that it could be you, did you feel hope? Okay. Sometimes people don't feel a lot, but oftentimes they do. Interviewing is a really good way to learn the ways that the Lord moves. What did you feel? You felt hope, like I could be healed. Yeah, that you could be healed. Okay. Cameron, could you run and grab me really quick with some tissues or my nose has been really runny from the cold. 
Oh, there we go. We've already got some. Okay. All right. So when we get to the end, and I'm having uh, different ones of you come up <clears throat> to minister to you, another thing that's important, she is going to have more faith for your shoulders and that part of the back to be healed in this moment than I do. Because not only does faith come to you when you realize that's for me, faith comes in Berta. When you give a word and you see the acknowledgement, you realize, I heard from God. That quickens you. That quickens you in a way that the one who didn't receive the word is not quickened in that present moment. Now, what that doesn't mean is that somebody else couldn't pray, anybody could pray for you and you could be healed. But if we're just speaking about probability, more happens in a higher climate of faith. Most of the time. When there's a higher climate of faith within your spirits and within Berta, from you realizing that's me and her realizing I heard from God, there's a higher chance of healing happening. So as they call out these different words of knowledge, when we get to the end in just a minute here, come to the one who had the word that applies to you for them to lay hands on you and pray for you, okay? All right. So tell us your name and the word and how it came. My name's Kathy. Um, I'm not sure if I've actually done this correctly. I don't know if it's going to make any sense. But you, um, you were talking earlier, and you just mentioned randomly the name Elizabeth. Now, I have a very good friend called Elizabeth who needs help, and I know that through you and your lovely can-do, that my Elizabeth could get some real help. Um, it was just when you said it, and I immediately said to my husband, I wish Elizabeth could be here. I know she's not been well today. She has, um, she has problems with bipolar and PTSD and things like that. So, yeah, <laughs> d I don't know if I've done the right thing saying this, but I felt it as soon as you said it. Where's your husband? Your husband is right here. So, Mr. Husband. John. John. I want you to do something right now, if you can. Uh, I want you to text Elizabeth that she can be healed right now. Yeah. We, s we have seen hundreds upon hundreds, probably into the thousands of, of individuals, healed through text messages and through being called on the phone, sometimes across the globe in meetings when we have a word come that's from them. Aren't you glad that God is not limited to natural space and time. There's no distance with him. We've seen people healed when they didn't even see the message that there was a word for them or that they could be healed. Sometimes we've, been, we've had occasions where I remember there was one man who uh, was, had a great deal of paralysis uh, in his lower back and hips and legs. And uh, a friend of his texted him. He was asleep. There was this word for you in the meeting. Someone had your name. Someone had your condition. He wakes up in the morning and just forgets, I suppose, that he was paralyzed, partially paralyzed, rolls over, gets out of bed, stands up, and realizes, what am I doing? I can't do this, but I'm doing it. Realizes he was healed, and then gets his phone to tell his friend that he's healed, and then he sees the message. Now, if anyone comes up to me at the end and says, well, theologically, how does that work? I don't know, but I know we've seen it. What I would say is it works because the Lord is good and because he loves to heal more than we do. So you did absolutely the right thing, and we will pray for Elizabeth, okay? My name is Monica, and um, what I felt is a strong emotion here in stomach and the pressure here. Yes, yes, and, uh, and I, I heard the voice healing. Yeah, but I felt something that there is someone who doesn't want to say about this. Yeah, that's it. And I'm still shaking, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Now, when you felt this in your stomach, what did you feel? Did you just feel heavy? Yeah, like something very heavy. What, what emotion? Like a heaviness and a sadness? Or not sadness? Not sadness. 
Okay. 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 So let's let's examine these two things. Does anyone have anything wrong with the back of your neck? Um, wh now, this is similar to a, a word of knowledge I had is that someone has a nerve issue right here affecting the base of the neck, particularly painful as you're going to rotate your neck, turn your head around, uh, especially, I think, in doing this kind of a motion. Um, now, I don't know if that is an extension of something like a whiplash or what necessarily that that is. Uh, if there's been a blow um, to some part of the body, a fall, something that's affected the neck and either the nerves or your cervical disc. Is that anybody in here? Does that make sense to anybody in here? Okay. All right. Anybody else? Neck is connected with the shoulder. That's okay. By the way, you don't have to stop at one word of knowledge. It's, it's, it's another thing that the enemy will often work to get us to do is to think, well, and, and, and sometimes to even think things like, well, I'm not, they need, somebody else needs it more than me. Everybody needs him the same, the same. And he loves you and wants to heal you all the same. He wants to heal cancer as much as he wants to heal a pain in your pinky finger. He wants all of his people whole. He despises pain. He despises the devices of the enemy. Okay? So I'm saying that as well because many times we have a lot of people in meetings that have a lot of different conditions, things wrong with them. And often they'll respond to one and maybe the first two or three things. Uh, we've been in uh, meetings where someone had 10, 15 things wrong with them. And they'll stop acknowledging it after a certain point because of thinking different things like someone needs it more. I don't know. Could God really want to heal me that much that he would give all those things? The answer to that is yes. Yes, he does. Okay, so the next thing here that uh, Monica said, does anybody have anything that's, that's wrong? Either d Emotionally, does this make sense to somebody? Or sometimes you'll feel sensations, and again, it can be a physical condition, despite the fact that she didn't feel pain. So what that could indicate is that someone has something wrong uh, with this region of the body, either, uh, and this could be something from gallbladder issue, intestinal issue, and pain, bowel issues, uh, liver issues, uh, just uh, all the way to something very extreme such as Crohn's disease, which we've also seen healed uh, very frequently. Does anyone have anything going on right around here in any part of the abdomen? Okay, one, anybody else? Yeah, stand if you have that. Can you stand up? Yeah, that's okay. Like I said, I know some of these things will be different, but it's good. Okay? By the way, another reason we tell people to stand is before we pray, we see people healed frequently just when they stand. <clears throat> Does anybody else have anything wrong around their stomach? Right here? Okay, can you stand up? Anybody else have that? Anything wrong here? Okay, how about let's move up from here just a little bit. Uh, about 25 minutes ago, I felt in my sternum like something was kind of stabbing me like this, pressing very hard right here in the chest cavity. Does, it, does that make sense to anybody in here? Here, Can you stand up? Yep, okay. Now, I'm, I'm curious, was there some kind of accident? Did something hit you right here? Because it felt to me like something hit me. Yeah, something hit you here. Um, not a long time ago, I don't think. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I... I was it not too long ago? Like, I've, I've, like maybe, I think it was less than a year ago that this, whatever this is, started to happen. Is that right? Yeah? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. All right. Anybody else have an issue here or up into the sternum? Okay, stand up if that's you. And uh, does anyone have anything wrong as well with your aortic valve, your aortic heart valve? Anything wrong with the aortic heart valve? Any type of blockage? 
any type of circulation issue. Okay, thank you. My name is Lorraine, <laughs> and I'm married. <laughs> My husband's sitting over there, John, and I have a couple Not the same John. <laughs> it's good to know. And I have a couple of children. I have um, six <laughs> and two extra, that's eight. So that's me. Did, did you feel like you had any type of uh, word of knowledge that God was showing you? Something that t is to be healed tonight? Yes. What did you feel? I have, um, I get like, um, in my bones, it, it feels like sore. It hurts. And was this all, all over, or was this just in your arms and the, kind of from your elbow down to, and in the knees? Yeah, okay. All right. So does Lorraine's word there make sense to anybody? Does anybody have, now I don't know if this has been an accident. I don't know if this is arthritic uh, or what, uh, calcium deficiency Perhaps we see, we've seen that healed many times in people, iron deficiencies, things that cause weakness or decay, premature decay uh, within the bones of the body. Does anybody have something like that going on in your shins or from about your elbows down into the hands? Anybody have any issues there in the bones that needs to be healed? Right here? Okay. Can you? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I actually earlier had a great deal of pain in my left wrist. When I was moving it as well, so I think that uh, along with that, I know this could be, of course, the same word. Or it could be someone different. Does someone have an injury to your left wrist that needs to be healed? Okay, all right, thank you. And last one here before Camden and I give the rest of what we're sensing, and then we're going to pray. Everyone's gone. <laughs> I'm I'm here. Yeah, there we go. There we go. So I gave John and Lorraine a lift here tonight. And when we were coming up, I spoke about a young boy um, who my son's a goalkeeper for the local football team. And one of his teammates had an accident last week at football. The, the other team's goalkeeper banged into him and he had to be taken to hospital and he's in a really, really bad way with his kidney. Um, he was, they tested his urine and um, there was blood. And then they've um, done a, a scan on him and his kidney's bleeding. And you mentioned kidney earlier and he's got a stent put in his kidney um, and it's still bleeding. Um, so he might have to get rid of his kidney. So I'll just come up here because he's got what's, what's his name? Jamie. So I'm going to, before praying for everybody else in just a minute, uh, pray for it because you, we've had two people standing in because there were things that I mentioned that had to do with people that they know. So I'm going to pray for Jamie and for Elizabeth and then move into praying for everybody else. But before we do that, remember I said one of the very important things is for you all to start off at least getting prayer from the people that called out what you had. So Berta and uh, Monica and everybody else that was up here just a moment ago giving words of knowledge, can you come back up? Yeah, not everybody just yet, but those of you who gave words of knowledge, I want you to come up. And now we're going to transition into laying on of hands and prayer ministry. So you, I'm sure, because we've got a small group here, which is good for this type of training, because the bigger the group, the harder it is to remember uh, who had your condition. The ones of you who had what these different people called out, and so I, I, I remember a few of them. I, I remember you, sir, and you, ma'am, need to come to Berta here. Uh, come to, and just make a little line, the person that had your condition and they're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray as well, uh, but they're going to pray for you. 
And there's a few other instructions I have just before you start to pray, okay? And it's this. I don't want you to pray very long prayers. I want you to pray short, what we call commanding prayers. And I want to clarify here. People many times misunderstand us, and they think what we are saying is we're commanding God. We're not saying that. You could try to command God all day long, and it wouldn't work. Jesus purchased salvation, and he shed his blood for deliverance and healing for his people. It's the bread of his children. When sickness occurs in the body, things are out of order with the way God created it to function. What we are commanding is that the body would come back into order. Almost every prayer of healing in the Old and the New Covenant is a prayer of command. So I want you to pray short prayers over them. Uh, do what we call an interview really quickly. Now, what we mean by that is, of course, you all don't have to spend quite as much time here because you all are a community. You know each other. So you know their names. But I want you to just, again, really quickly ask them, what's wrong with you? What's the condition? Have you gotten a diagnosis? Where is the pain in the body? Pray short commanding prayers, and that would be like this. So let's say uh, there's, a, there's a problem here in their shoulders. We would pray this way. In the name of Jesus, we release the power of the Spirit in the kingdom of God. I command his shoulder to come into order with the way it was created and designed to function. Amen. All right? We're going to pray short prayers after you pray for them. So with something, some things we realize you have to go and have further examination and some additional testing and time is required. That's okay. We understand that. But for many things, you can test it right away. For things like the shoulders, for example, and the pain of the back, after you pray for them, I want you to ask them these words. Test it out. Do what you ordinarily can't do or do what, if you tried to do it, it would be painful. And we're going to find, I believe, that as you continue to do things like move around the shoulders, that pain is going to begin to diminish. But again, it's another important principle of healing. If you never examine, you'll never know. And far too many times we can have active healing anointing flowing, but if we just say, in the name of Jesus, shoulder, be healed, God bless you, and we send them on their way, well, the Lord could be at work. And we've just sort of cut off the flow of the water, so to speak. Because sometimes the healing will happen, bam, right away, 80 to 100%. But often, to pray. There we go. Often we have to pray usually three or four times. And the best way to do that is short, commanding prayers. Remember the way that Jesus prayed, who's given us his authority. Lazarus, come forth. Eyes see, ears hear. Right? Pray short prayers. Remember the fact that the Lord has given you these words for these people. God's revealed, I want to heal them right now. Okay? And have them examine and test those things out. Uh, now, you can go ahead and start to pray for them. As they're doing that, I'm going to give the remaining words uh, that I have. Kim is going to give the words that she has. And any of you who had something, like I know uh, I didn't get your names, but right here, you with the uh, blue denim -y type of button-down shirt. Yes, and right behind you here in the, in the pink uh, hoodie, I think, or not a hoodie, but anyway. So I know two of you two had some, uh, some of the conditions that I called out. Uh, what I want you to do is just as these are coming to the ones who had the word for them, I want you to come up to me. I'm going to pray for you. And uh, I'm going to do that after I give these other words in lodge. If any of you have the rest of these conditions that I call out, come to me so I can pray for you. And if the same for Camden. <clears throat> uh, I felt as well like there was someone in here I don't quite know exactly what this is. I don't know if this has been an injury to the, uh, well, what do you call it? I don't know. Some uh, part of the throat. I don't know if this is a growth. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but I felt like someone has a condition that's causing a lot of pain and difficulty when you're trying to swallow. And I had the sense that it was... Uh, Swallowing pretty much anything. Does that apply to anybody in here? Has anyone been having an, an, a condition, 
affecting your throat that has been making it hard or very painful to swallow. Anybody in here? Okay. Is there uh, someone in the room or you know of someone uh, in need of healing with the name Oliver? All right. Uh, Is there someone who has been having difficulty? I don't know if this is COPD, if it's bronchitis or what it is, but a lot of difficulty breathing, especially, I believe, over the last year or two years, a lot of tightness and pain in your lungs when it comes to breathing. I believe especially at night when you're trying to sleep. Okay, one. Anybody else? Two. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this this is a, I don't know if I've quite received this before. Is there somebody in here who is, uh, has something going on? Now, my guess with this would be some sort of chemical thing or a uh, vitamin deficiency or something like that. That would be my guess. But does someone have, have something that is causing uh, abnormalities in your nails and your hair? Does that make sense to anybody? I don't know what that would be. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know. That's just an uh, impression that came. And by the way, here's something else to encourage you as you continue long after we leave to operate in this and do this. If you're right, it's good because you get to see the person healed. If you're wrong and no one has it, it's good because no one has that problem. So you win either way. Amen? Amen. It's, it's better if no one has the sickness to start with. But if they have it and you're right, you can just minister to them and see them well. Okay? Uh, is there anyone, now earlier I know I mentioned uh, like an, an arrhythmia. Uh, I don't think that was me randomly throwing that out. I think there's someone in here who has an abnormal heartbeat. And I get the sense that it's not consistent and that it's not always too fast or always too slow. I get the sense that it, 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 it flow functions Weirdly. Okay, both of you. Three. Okay. All right. Uh, I also felt like there was someone in here who was involved in some sort of incident on a motorcycle. Is that anybody? Has anybody had any kind of injury from a motorcycle? Okay. All right. Many, many years ago. Well, that's okay. By the way, there's no time restriction either. It doesn't. We've seen people that were injured when they were infants that were in their 80s in meetings that got healed of their problem. And we've seen people healed on the way of things they were uh, injured with on the way to the meeting as well. It doesn't matter how recently the injury or how far back it is. God's power is sufficient to bring restoration. Is there someone who is having... uh, issue with your one of your uh, right eyes. I, I, I don't know if it's a detached retina. It could be a detached retina. Uh, is that somebody? Does somebody have a detached retina in the right eye? You? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Left. By the way, but see, I, I jokingly, I call these dyslexic words of knowledge. Sometimes you'll get something and you'll say it's the right and it's the left or the left is the right. And okay. The right, detach retina in the right eye and the left eye. Cataract? Cataract in the right eye. Okay. All right. Okay. Is there someone with inflammation in your large intestine? The cause, I don't know, but inflammation in the large intestine. That's been going on for at least like six or seven months. Okay. Does anyone have plantar fasciitis in the right heel? Plantar fasciitis in the right heel. At least I think it's that. It could be some sort of a bone spur uh, that's in the in the right in the right foot. Oh, is that one? <laughs> 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It didn't work out? That has Crohn's. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I think at least for now, that's all the words I have. And uh, now, by the way, I see some of you have uh, gone and sat back down. I want to, which is okay, but I want to see, how are you feeling? Did you have any improvement in your back or your shoulders after you prayed for it so far? Click in your back. A good click? A good click. Okay. All right. Thank, uh, thank you for that. Now, how, how, are your sho- okay. how are your shoulders? They feel great. Shoulders but feel great. What, you know the, um, the one who spoke about the stomach? Mm-hmm. I, I, I believe it's all linked. As I was driving, I felt hey, strain in my shoulders, both shoulders. And I thought, hang on, I'm just driving, relaxed driving. And then it came to me, you know, that pain here on the neck, the shoulder, is linked to what I feel. Hmm. And what the la- th- this lady, lovely lady said about the stomach, <laughs> um, the Lord made me understand that the way he's carved me, my level of sensitivity is such that, and someone else has said it, but I never took it seriously, is so intense that I feel it here, and which is where I I feel the strain on my neck and on the shoulder because I can do things with my shoulder. But when I go to the hospital, yes, the arteries in the shoulder, they have done a lot of um, procedures on my shoulder. So to the glory of God, I can use my hands to do a lot more things than I used to. Mm. Um, And what I feel there, I believe it's like God saying, it's there to remind you of what I have done for you over the years. But this link to that is the Lord telling me it's just who you are, the emotional pain you feel, not just for yourself, but for other people. I see okay. people and I can connect with their pain. What was I your name? Level. Georgina. Georgina. Yeah. So I want you now to show us or do do something that ordinarily would, would create discomfort and tension in your back. Moving, twisting, bending this way, this way. Yeah. Just go ahead and start to move around. And then tell us how you're feeling. I couldn't do this before. Couldn't unzip my... I couldn't even put my hand to my mouth. For how now long? Now I can do all that. For how long? Because um, I had frozen shoulder, so mm-hmm. the shoulder was frozen for a long time. A long time. At least six months or more. At least six months or more. Yeah, that and Verna prayed surgery. for you, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. We've just seen... <laughs> now that's... Left shoulder, right shoulder, neck condition, back condition, shoulders, neck, and back, which tend to be linked together. But typically, we would count those as a multi-conditional healing, multiple healings that Georgina has just experienced. So God is moving here, and I didn't pray for her. Berta prayed for her. So God, again, is reinforcing. God is preaching this now to you, not me. He is saying to you, I want to use all of you. I don't just want to use Brian or Cameron or the pastors. I'm going to use Berta. I'm going to use all of you. All of you are called and equipped and anointed by the Spirit. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anybody else that would say, yeah, if somebody's prayed for me and there's something where I can sense right now improvement. Something has gotten better. Yeah? What's, what's going on? My neck was really stiff. I have it a lot and I could hardly move and now my Amen. And how, so you, you've got a lot of mobility back, and how is, the, how is the pain level? Is it gone? It has. It's gone. Um, I had a real bad neck when I arrived, and mm. um, it's not hurting now. And I... Thank you, Jesus. Okay. By the way, I, I, I'm curious about something. Before I, I pray for particularly uh, the two of you, is there any type of movement? I know sometimes when people forward, when they have stomach or sternum conditions, there's a tightness and a tension that will come. Uh, now, that may not be the case, but is there any type of movement or something that you could do that ordinarily causes uh, pain and disruption here? 
No. Okay. All right. Just wanted to check. That's you. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to have Camden now give the words and on she has, and we'll wrap this up by um, the rest of you coming to the ones here who had the different conditions you called out. And of course, I'm going to pray for Jamie and Elizabeth. And then the rest of you who had words that I called out, come to me so that I can pray for you for healing. Or to Camden if, if you have something that applies to you. All right. Uh, so I also got kidney. I specifically got left kidney. Is, is, his, is it a left kidney that he's dealing with, or do you know? If you don't know, that's okay. 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 Was there anyone else in here dealing with a kidney issue? You can, like, wave at me or stand or something right there. Okay. Is yours the left kidney, or do you know? The right one. Okay. All right. Just curious. Uh, right hip socket. Is there anyone dealing with an issue in their right hip socket? Right hip. It's like feeling this pain like right here. You're dealing with pain? Okay. Yeah. Are you in pain right now? No, but you've dealt with it before. Okay. Uh, does anyone have lupus? It's like a condition with your blood. Lupus? Autoimmune issue right there? It's a similar problem. Oh, genetic problem. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Some of these are interesting. Is there a Samuel, or you guys know a Samuel that needs healing? Samuel? Yeah? You know Samuel that needs healing? Okay. <laughs> All right. What about Jones? Jones that needs healing. Maybe it's the last name. Jones. Does anyone, you know a Jones that needs healing? Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> okay, this one is interesting. It's either going to be God or it's not. Um, I saw this, like, spelled out. Uh, it was, like, maybe Okowano. It was O-K-O-W-A-N-O. -O. Does that make sense to anyone? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, yeah, I just saw that spelled out in my head. All right. Um, does Rose Court mean anything to anyone? Does anyone live, like, near a Rose Court? Rose Court. That's near the hospital. The one that David is at? Jamie? Well, there, I know we had spoken about David earlier, but okay, Rose Court, that's near the hospital. Okay. Um, all right. Does, has someone worked with locomotives? I was seeing like a locomotive. Does anyone work with like trains or locomotives or does that make sense to anyone? I know it's kind of different, but your late dad did. Okay. <laughs> All right, I know some of these are different, but, so, but sometimes God's spoken to me this way, so I like to take risks where someone needs healing and they work somewhere. <laughs> All right, and then the last one. Uh, this is a country in Africa, but uh, I heard Botswana. Is there anyone that has, like, s someone in Botswana that they know, or does that country make sense to anyone? Maybe you want to go there. I don't know. Does that make sense to anyone back there? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right, if you can just, yeah, connect with me. I'm just curious what that means, but okay. Um, I, for the life of me, cannot remember what this is, uh, but does anyone have uh, hypoglycemia? Low sugar levels. Does anybody have that? Okay. Well, if you start to think a little later and you remember that you have that, come find me. And um, there's one, one other thing that I, I sensed just a moment ago. Uh, is there someone, it's not low sugar, but uh, I don't know what the name of this condition is, but is there someone who has low oxygen in your blood? Low oxygenation in the blood, is that... Does anybody have that, or does that make sense to anybody? Something going on with the blood where uh, I know sometimes certain vessels can. Anemia? Low blood levels, okay. Hypoglycemia is low oxygen. Hypo okay. All right. 
your mother. Okay. Now, what I want the rest of you to do is if you had any of those things that we... Yes. I have a question. Yeah. <clears throat> Just I have a lot of emotion and a lot of things. It's a, a person here. It's about uh, unforgiveness. It's maybe one or more person. You carry unforgiveness in your heart. And it's about your mom. And one letter with C was in my mind. I, I'm full of emotion and I'm shaking yeah. inside. Okay. What was your name? I'm Alex. Alex. If that makes sense to you, find Alex. Let Alex minister to you. Uh, but for the rest of you, if you had any of those things that we've called out so far, stand up all together with us. What I'm going to do now is... No, that's fine. That's okay. Uh, I had a, an issue recently that could have been cancerous but wasn't and I go on Monday for whatever they're going to do they, I don't know what it is they give long names for everything very exotic names and yeah. uh, so I'm not sure but it is, it is to check it is to check my blood and um, I, I, I don't know what, 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 is, what is in there was it that word was lymphoma lymph, lymphoma or lymph phone or something like that okay so, so that's on on monday okay all right anybody else who had some one of those things that we called out or i want to extend it if you if we none of us had a word for you but you know you need healing in your body i want you to stand up all together with us now and we're going to close this out in two parts i'm going to pray corporately over everyone here if it is something testable have you test it out again quickly and then at the end Everyone who had something that anyone called out, if, if I had a word that applies to you, come to me. If Camden had it, come to her. If Monica or Kathy or Lul, Laureen, I was going to say Lauren, it's close, and I didn't get your name. Julie, come to them, okay? I want you, if you can, put your hand on the part of your body that needs to be healed. Put your hand on the part of your body that needs to be healed. And I want you to just close your eyes, and we're going to pray. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, we invite you even more. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Vain Espiritu Santo. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, I... Thank you for your grace, your healing grace, your power, your anointing, your ability and desire for healing and for wholeness. Jesus, as you cursed the fig tree and commanded it to wither, I curse the pain in their bodies. We curse the sickness and the authority as your disciples, as your imagers. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak healing and wholeness into their bodies, the resurrection life of God into their bodies. We command the eyes to be restored, the stomachs and the kidneys, the neck and the bone conditions, all skeletal conditions, everything affecting the blood, all spinal irregularity. I just felt like I heard this impression, cystic fibrosis. Lord, we command cystic fibrosis to be healed. We speak to cartilage that is weakened or places where there's no cartilage in the bones, Lord, recreate the cartilage. Recreate the cartilage in the name of Jesus. I bless hearts to be healed. All types, all manner of heart conditions be healed in the authority of the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We speak to the sternums, God, to be healed. Jesus' name. If it's possible, move and, and test and do something. Again, a lot of these things we can't quite know right here and now, and that's okay. We'll be able to find out in time. But if you're able to test when the hips, the knees, uh, through squatting, bending down, shoulder issues, elbows, wrists, 
head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Anything that you're able to test, move around for at least 30 seconds or so and try it out. And I want you to shout or wave at me if there's improvement that started to happen. One, okay, all right. Is, uh, Judah, is it your hip? It's your hip. It's feeling good. Feels good, okay. And uh, ma'am, is it your wrist? Your right wrist. Left and the right wrist. The right one mainly. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else at the moment feeling any improvement? He is. Amen. He's always good. All right. Thank you, Lord. Okay. I'm going to uh, officially wrap this up, and we're going to move into uh, laying on of hands again to come to anybody who had the conditions that we called out. We're going to lay hands on you, pray for you. And when we come back tomorrow morning, it's going to be quite different. It's going to be very short in terms of teaching. It's primarily going to be stories, and we're going to pray for you a little bit differently. We're going to be having an impartation service tomorrow morning. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more tomorrow on why it is that we do that, what we believe the Bible says about its importance. We're going to pray for you, and uh, it's going to be very significant, very significant. So I will see you tomorrow, and I'll officially wrap us up here and close us other than praying and laying hands on you, unless uh, pastors, either of you, has anything else to say. All right, Cam, do you have anything else to say? Amen. And Lord, we, we bless Elizabeth and we bless Jamie. And together we agree corporately for manifestation of full healing in their bodies. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak life to them. Life to them. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Okay. God really likes Elizabeth's tonight. <clears throat> All right. Love you guys. Thank you for having me. I will see you tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, come to, come to us to pray for you for healing. All right? God bless you.